Hello, I'm Dr. Jennifer Mann from Physical Electronics, and this work was presented at ACAJA 2017 in Montpellier, France, and at the AVS National Meeting in 2017 at, in Tampa, Florida. Today I will be discussing hard X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy experiments performed with the newest instrument from Phi and OVAC by the Qantas. I'm going to cover a few details about the instrument and then show a few examples and applications data. In general, photon energies of 2 keV and below are considered conventional XPS, which would include magnesium, aluminum, and zirconium X-ray sources. Hard X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, or HACSPIS, covers photon energy ranges between 5 and 10 keV, which would include chromium and gallium X-ray sources. There are some benefits to performing HACSPIS compared to conventional XPS. For example, when the photon energy is increased, so does the information depth, so HACSPIS can be used for more bulk analysis. HACSPIS can be used to study layers of interest that are 2 to 10 nanometers below the surface without sputtering, making it non-destructive. Since HACSPIS is not as surface sensitive as XPS, there are less strict requirements for preparing a sample surface. In addition, higher photon energies mean that higher energy core electrons can be accessed. Currently, HACSPIS is used to study multi-layer advanced electronic devices, such as OXRAM, HEMT, or HI-K dielectrics. Um, most HACSPIS is formed at synchrotron facilities. These have the advantage of having a high X-ray flux, which compensates for the reduction of photoelectron cross-section with higher photon energies. They have high energy resolution, and you can also vary the photon energy. Some of the disadvantages are that uh, you have to travel to the facility. Not everyone has a synchrotron nearby. There are costs to using the synchrotron. Uh, you must submit requests for time on the beam line, and you're given a limited time to run those experiments. Phi and Ulvac Phi have developed a laboratory instrument that combines both traditional XPS measurements with a monochromated aluminum K-alpha X-ray source plus extended depth of analysis experiments using a monochromated chromium K-alpha source, which has a photon energy of 5,414.9 eV. So this is our new Qantas, and I want to emphasize here that anybody who is familiar with Phi's scanning microprobe XPS, especially the Quantera 2, we'll find this, that the Qantas has the same performance as a Quantera 2 plus analysis with a chromium X-ray source. First, I'm going to touch on some of the features that are common to both our Quantera 2 and our new Qantas instrument. They both use Phi's scanning microprobe technology, where we use a focused electron beam to generate a focused X-ray beam. Using the scanning microprobe, we are able to generate X-ray-induced secondary electron images, also called SXIs. Um, and for example, I have shown an SXI of a copper TEM grid taken with the aluminum K-alpha source. These images are generated with the same X-ray source and the same analyzer that are used during XPS data acquisition. So that means that no additional image and analysis position alignment is needed. And the contrast mechanism in an SXI is mainly dependent on the photoelectron yield, meaning different chemical environments. So this makes SXIs really useful for either finding defects on samples or verifying that your sample is uniform. In addition, both instruments are equipped with a floating monoatomic argon gun for inorganic thin film analysis, and both instruments have high throughput analysis. For example, we have an automated sample introduction into the analysis chamber. There are two ultra-high vacuum parking locations in the instrument, and both instruments have automated dual beam charge compensation for studying insulating samples. All of these features are the same technology as the Quantera 2 platform, but the difference in the Quantes is that it has an additional hard X-ray source. 
it's a focused monochromatic chromium K-alpha X-ray source, and this source offers three times greater analysis depth than conventional XPS. We use the same electron gun, shown here, that we use to generate the aluminum K-alpha X-rays, but we have two different monochromators. And we can take SXIs using either of the X-ray sources so we can ensure that they are aligned. And all of the switching between the two X-ray sources is automated, and it takes about one minute to switch between the two. So before I go into the applications of using the chromium X-ray source, I'm just going to show a couple of the uh, gains that you get when you use a higher photon energy source. So the first is, as I've said previously, uh, three times greater depth of analysis. So this is an example showing 25 nanometers of SiO2 on a silicon substrate. And we see with the, using the aluminum K-alpha source, we can only see the silicon oxide. However, by using the chromium K-alpha source, we can see much deeper into the sample and see both the silicon oxide and the silicon metal without having to uh, sputter. With this thick of a sample using the aluminum K-alpha, one would have to sputter in order to see the underlying silicon substrate. In addition, um, with Haxpis, you have access to additional core photoelectron transitions. So here I have shown both the Haxpis and XPS surveys of a silver foil sample. So the XPS is in blue and Haxpis in red. And the purple region here shows the energy range accessible with the traditional XPS uh, photon source. So with the Haxpis uh, source, we see that there is a significantly larger binding energy window. Um, and we can see, uh, in addition to what we can see at, with the aluminum X-ray source, we can also see the 2S and 2P transitions. And also, with any case where you have two X-ray sources, if you have an OJ peak or OJ manifold shown here, that is overlapping a transition of interest, you can switch to the chromium source and move those OJ lines out of the way or to a different energy. One of the challenges in using higher photon energy is that the photoelectron cross-section is reduced as you increase the photon energy. Um, for example, I have shown the XPS survey of hafnium oxide, shown in red and the Haxpis survey um, shown in blue. If we look only at the hafnium 4D transition here, we see that there is 50 times more signal in the XPS spectrum than in the Haxpis spectrum. However, the hafnium 4D peak is not the highest intensity uh, transition in the Haxpis data. It's actually the hafnium 3D peak. And if we compare the intensity between the hafnium 4D taken with the aluminum K alpha X ray versus with the hafnium 3D with the chromium K alpha, the difference is only, it's only six times smaller, which is a far more acceptable reduction in counts. So with the additional core electrons that are energetically accessible with the Haxpis source, it is possible that there may be a more favorable transition that can be acquired without a drastic change in signal as um, if you were to use the lower binding energy transition. So the data still can be collected in a reasonable amount of time. So using both X, both X-ray sources or two transitions with very different binding energies, we can use the differences in these kinetic energies of the photoelectrons to look at surface versus bulk properties of a sample. And that's going to be my next two examples. So in this example, I'm looking at the surface oxidation of a Thai nitride cap from a sample provided by IMEC. So the titanium 2P transition was collected with both X-ray sources. And in both cases, we observe at least three chemical states corresponding to Thai nitride, Thai oxynitride, and 
titanium oxide. So although the transition is the same, the photoelectron kinetic energy is very different due to the photon energy of the two X-ray sources. So with the traditional aluminum K-alpha source, we have a kinetic energy of 1,027 eV, which is going to be a more surface sensitive kinetic energy. And with the chromium K-alpha X-ray source, we have a kinetic energy of about 5,000 eV, which is more sensitive to the bulk material. So we see that with the more surface sensitive spectrum, that the oxide is about as intense as the other two chemical states, whereas with the more bulk sensitive X-ray source, it is lower in intensity compared to the other two sources, so, or the other two chemical states. So this indicates that the oxide is more towards the surface of the sample. So in this example, I showed the same transition, but with two different photon energies. But we can also look at two different transitions in the HAXPA spectrum. So for this example, I've used two reference samples provided by Letty, a tie nitride film and a titanium film. So I've, to the left, shown the titanium 1S transition, which has, has a very high binding energy, giving it an electron kinetic energy of 442, which is more surface sensitive, versus the titanium 2P transition which has a much higher photoelectron kinetic energy of about 5,000 dV and is more sensitive to the bulk material. In my titanium nitride sample shown at the top, the oxide has the highest contribution in the titanium 1S transition, consistent with it being more on the surface, and the nitride has the highest contribution in the titanium 2P transition, consistent with it being more towards the bulk of the sample. The titanium metal spectrum is similar. In the surface sensitive kinetic energy, we see only the oxide here and no metal, whereas we clearly see uh, the metal below the surface in the titanium 2P transition. So for the last portion of my talk, I'm going to show a couple examples of looking for buried layers with XPS versus HAXPIS. So my first example is fairly straightforward. This sample was provided to us by IMEC and is a layered structure that has three nanometers of hafnium oxide, one nanometer of aluminum oxide, a sulfur monolayer on an indium gallium arsenide substrate. And there are different thicknesses to the tie nitride cap in order to change the depth of the sulfur monolayer of interest. So I'm only going to focus on can we or can we not detect the sulfur monolayer. And in the case of the aluminum K using the aluminum K alpha x-ray, we cannot see the sulfur in any of the samples. However, with using the increased depth of analysis of the chromium x-ray source, we can see the sulfur in the thinnest of the samples with the 5 nanometer cap and Perhaps a slight increase, we can slightly see some sulfur in the 10 nanometer cap. If I only had the aluminum K alpha x-ray source, I would have either needed thinner samples to be made or I would have had to remove these layers uh, with a perhaps ion gun etching in order to get to detect the sulfur monolayer. But in the case of the thinnest sample with chromium, there is no need to do that. Well, in my final example, I have a high electron mobility transistor provided to us by Letty. It consists of a 20 nanometer layer of aluminum, followed by a 5 nanometer layer of tantalum, and then 22 nanometers of aluminum gallium nitride, and then a gallium nitride substrate. So the structure was verified by TEM, and I have three um, of the same sample with different processes. So the first is just as is, there was no annealing done. And the second, um, the annealing temperature was 400 degrees C. And in the third sample, the annealing temperature was at 600 C. 
So I'm just going to try to answer a couple of basic questions with this device is, which are, which layers can I detect with XPS versus HACSPIS? And how does the photoelectron spectrum change with the different annealing processes? So first, I'm gonna show the XPS survey of the three samples. Uh, the red trace had no annealing the blue trace was at 400 C and the green trace was at 600 C and this will be true for all of the examples. So starting at the top layer, aluminum, do we see aluminum in the photoelectron spectrum? Yes, we see both the aluminum 2S and 2P, not a surprise because it's the top layer. And additionally, we see oxygen, which is common, aluminum is very reactive with oxygen. So moving down. So there's tantalum 20 nanometers below the aluminum. Can we see any tantalum with the traditional X-ray source? And in the case of the sample with no annealing, we cannot see any tantalum. But with the two annealed samples, we can see traces of tantalum, both at 400 C and 600 C. So this indicates that the tantalum could be diffusing towards the surface during the annealing process. So moving on to the next layer, the aluminum gallium nitride, can we see any gallium? So for the sample with no annealing, we cannot see any gallium. And with the lowest temperature anneal at 400, we also do not see any gallium. We can only see gallium in the highest temperature anneal, and it's very, it's a very small peak. So uh, let's switch to the HACSPIS source and see uh, which of these layers we can see using the chromium K-alpha X-ray. Okay, so this is the HACSPIS survey for the three samples. And let's start again at the top. So the aluminum, we can see aluminum easily. And note here that I've actually used the aluminum 1S transition because it's much, has a much more favorable cross-section than the aluminum 2S and 2P, which you can see are quite small. So if we look at the aluminum 1S, we see that there's a shift in relative intensities between the aluminum metal and aluminum oxide. It looks like as we increase the annealing temperature, we increase the oxide. So next, the tantalum. So the, with the aluminum K-alpha X-ray source, we could only see tantalum in the two annealed samples. In this one, tantalum 3D, which is here, we can see tantalum in every single sample. It certainly is less intense in the sample with the no annealing, but it's clearly present. So this is still indicating that these are a little closer to the surface, what they are better, they have better intensity or signal to noise. These were collected at the same, the same amount of time. So, but we can see in all three samples, tantalum, which we could not do with the aluminum K-alpha X-ray source. So the next uh, layer that we wanna look at is the aluminum gallium nitride layer and so Remember, we could only see gallium in the highest temperature anneal. So in, with the HACSPIS source, we can see gallium in all three samples. So in the sample with no annealing, it looks like we have only really one chemical state, which is consistent with gallium nitrogen bonds. And with the two annealed samples, we can see what looks like a another chemical state towards lower binding energy, and then a shoulder forming at higher binding energy. So with the, with the aluminum K-alpha source, we could just barely see this peak only at 600 C, and it would have been very difficult to look for chemical state changes. So in conclusion, the Quantas is the newest instrument from physical electronics and OLVAC Phi, and it's based on the established Quantera 2 XPS platform and has all of its capabilities. It can perform both traditional XPS measurements using an aluminum K-alpha X-ray source, plus extended depth of analysis using the chromium K-alpha X-ray source. Um, the instrument has automated dual beam charge compensation, so that allow, will allow you to uh, 
study insulating materials both with traditional XPS and HAXPIS. Um, you can look at both surface and bulk chemistries in a single spectrum due to the large change in kinetic energy between two transitions. Um, I showed you an example where we could observe a sulfur monolayer with the HAXPIS source that couldn't be detected with XPS. And using the HAXPIS source, we observed a gallium layer that was 25 nanometers below the surface, as well as changes to its chemistry depending on the annealing temperature of the device. I would like to thank both IMIC and Letty for providing us with samples, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>